Hey, folks. Hey, Neo, I see you. Hey, good afternoon. Yeah, oh, you're I'm up lying. awfully late. Wait. Yeah, no, actually, this is early. Sorry. This is the day you're supposed to be here. It's Thursdays. Never mind. Summer is definitely here in Seattle. No kidding. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. And hey, uh, good afternoon. How are you doing? Yeah. Good morning to you. Good evening to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon, David. I'm in the car today, so I'll be hiding from camera. So being more appropriately, not have my phone on. Are we uh, waiting to get started or I mean, we always, I think we all, these days we have plenty of things to talk about. So uh, I see there's a number of agenda items on there. Go David, go. Um, so I, I mean, uh, in the spirit of, uh, you know, keeping things, uh, trying to focus on technical items uh, for this. I, I think there's just going down the list, uh, there's the verification plugins. Steve, you had some items to cover on that. Something you wanted yeah, to ask? Yeah, so I, I was a little surprised with that one and I wasn't sure whether I just missed something when I was on vacation or what. So I just wanted to get a better understanding of what was trying to be achieved there. Cause when I read it, I, I did. I just got flat. One, I didn't. I don't remember. Whether I was talk, focusing on a user story around that for RC one, and I was just getting a little concerned that our portability goal might be at risk if I if our verifier is required um, to verify a signature. So before I just drill any more details, I'm just wondering if you guys had more thoughts on what was being proposed there. I think um, um, we had talked about um, what custom verification workflows would look like, um, and this kind of goes into you know what if we, a a a a vendor wants to add in sort of like custom fields on top of the um, the basic sort of like you know notation uh, verification that we're aligning on here. Uh, what's a good mechanism to do that and still maintain the interoperability, right? Um, I don't think the way we have architected plugins in this specification necessarily prevents interoperability. Um, the way the signatures are being stored, um, you can store them on any registry. 
the base verification is still using the notation client um, and the verification plugins, um, at least everything I've seen in the spec so far, kind of calls out that you could potentially install them um, for any vendor in any space, right? So I think there's still the interoperability here. Um, this is really just more enabling some of the custom logic um, that signers and verifiers might want to implement um, and giving them a path to do so. I get that conceptually, but that's the our, that's kind of beyond the goal of what we initially set. So I don't understand what like some specifics would help here. And if there's something that's needed, then could we just add it to you know a, a property in the format to begin with? Because it just I, I want to make sure that if somebody's running something, it's signed in one cloud. I'm just using cloud vendor, whatever on-prem, that as that's promoted, that the signature can be verified by what's in notary, right? The notary client should be able to verify the, sign the supported signature formats without any external uh, componentry. So that, that was just new to me. Um, I think the we, we did have mm -hmm. this discussion very early on, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we talked about what the extended fields would look like, how we would look at validating them. Um, this is really, um, the specs to me are kind of clarifying more of what those, how to deal with those types of, of, of external validation or additional validation when we encountered them, right? Um, I would I would say that kind of like, you know, there are a basic set of things that notation is verifying, but um, I think the kind of trying to build consensus on some potentially additional things might actually stifle um, how quickly certain vendors could put out certain functionality, right? Um, I don't see anything here that like kind of like, you know, if the plugin isn't installed, like it's something that will skip that validation. Um, if the vendor marks it as critical versus if it's optional, it's something you could potentially run validation without. So I think this is kind of giving vendors that 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 decision of, you know, how critical do they feel some of this um, um, additional validation they want to do is. Um, I don't know that, you know, for everything that a specific vendor would want to do that you'd potentially get like broader alignment with notation. Um, I'd want to keep notation specs kind of more aligned with what we think like, you know, is a base set of um, checks that we'd want to do um, and really enable some of those additional um, um, kind of things that vendors feel they need that specific maybe to their architecture, um, they're able to kind of do right and like what's the, the risk too. that you're seeing here? Um, that I don't, a user can't verify something because there's vendor specific stuff in there. Like so, I, you're saying like, I, this is a very anti-pattern of what we intended with Notary to do. We, we definitely said extensibility for signing because we want to make sure that various key ball providers can be handled. Um, so there's no question on the signing uh, even to the point that that's why you don't need to check in code to Notary to uh, enable remote signing, right? Well, that's, that is the purpose of the plugin spec. But verification, somebody shouldn't have to depend on something external to verify a signature. Like that's a... I I think this is this is a choice for vendors, and it is a choice for people that are using those vendors, right? Um, it's a it, it's going in and saying that if you want to use some vendor specific functionality, then you could verify the signature anywhere. You can add in a vendor plugin to kind of go with it. Um, this isn't requiring you necessarily to kind of rehash notation per se. Um, and I think that interface itself is fairly transparent in terms of like, you know, how to get the plugin working. So um, to me, this is this is offering choice to kind of like from the, the end user perspective, right? Like if I am using a vendor specific signature format, I am also recognizing that I need a vendor plugin um, to go validate this if that is a critical part of the signature workflow. Um, if it's a non-critical part, then, you know, that's again a vendor choice in terms of like, you know, how they want to add in. Um, and so there, the the way the spec is written right now, like you, there are places where you can mark certain che checks and things as optional, um, certain things as critical, right? And so it's, it's, it's up to a vendor, I believe, to decide if they want to add a critical field um, that they feel um, would make sense versus like something that's optional. Um, and that's not something I think like, you know, we as from a notation perspective should kind of be limiting. 
they want to add a few points. What there. you're saying is actually exactly what I'm concerned about. There, there wasn't intended to be vendor specific signature formats or verifications. It's, it's not the signature, it's not the signature format. It's using the same signature format. All standard signature formats like JWS, CMS, et cetera, JWT even, they have provision to add custom signed attributes. And those custom signed attributes can be defined by the signer. They can be defined as critical or non-critical. So we are providing the same feature set in the notary signature spec because you cannot, you can standardize a basic set of attributes and that's what we have done. And you've seen the time that is taken to standardize the basic set of attributes. Uh, it's not possible to standardize all set of features that a particular vendor would want to support. So a vendor has choice of producing signatures that don't use any uh, any custom attributes or they can introduce custom attributes, they can mark it as critical. Uh, also from the plugin aspect, uh, it's not required for a plugin vendor to implement verification plugin. Both signing plugin, verification plugin are different set of features you can implement just a signing plugin without having to do anything with verification that use the standard verification. And in terms of scoping, we, if you, I pasted the, first version or the initial version of the plugin, uh, extensibility PR, we have verification workflow and verification extensibility as a high level concept defined multiple places there. And the only thing that we didn't have is we had a big hole in how exactly that, that takes place. And our early ideas were notation build, totally hand off verification to a plugin but that seems like you are relying too much on the plugin. So right now we have a balance where notation will always do a bunch of checks that it has standard checks. And this interface defines what potential steps could be offloaded to a plugin. And similar to the signing plugin, this makes the maintainers of Notary don't have to administer this or implement every custom verification feature that somebody comes up with, integrate it into notation. The vendor can decide which ones they want to pursue as a standard, which ones they want to support through a verification plugin. The question I have there, Melinda, is what happens when we start doing counter -site signatures and they start nesting? Like, at what layer of complexity do you say this is too much? Um, I didn't, I didn't get that in terms of counter signatures. If a counter, if I wrap a signature in a signature and the custom attributes are now in multiple places, the, the job of validating it's, it's the same, is the same thing. And in, in the scope of validating a single signature, either there are custom attributes or not. And yeah, yeah, but you're arguing that you're arguing that Notary will check the outer one. Not the inner one. No, 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 not the outer or inner. There's basically from your whole set of attributes, Notary knows about a standard set of attributes. And the provision, is, the provision is only to add additional non-standard attributes if defined by a vendor. I understand. Because everything, because everything cannot be want, standardized. Yeah, yeah, but just hang on. You're saying I want to allow the basic framework of we check the signatures on the outer, outermost layer and that the additional attributes are, are serviceable by an extension mechanism. Right, right. Uh, You're arguing right. That it kind of right. gets sideways as soon as there's an inner signature and now it's left up to the, the plugin to potentially know how to navigate and validate those signatures. Um, I think yeah, the, the concept no of outer inner and outer here isn't necessarily correct, right? It is a yeah. single signature that has both the attributes, the, the base attributes and the additional attributes. What you're describing from a, sorry? It, it may, it doesn't have to, but it may, okay. It may, yes. Yep. And so if we start thinking about counter signatures, um, counter signatures are essentially 
um, two separate sets of validation that are happening, right? <clears throat> in which case, um, you would go through that first signature validation. Um, you would identify sort of like, you know, what notation as a client is, is parsing and what the um, potential extensibility or, or plugin um, is going into. Um, and then you could repeat that for the inner signature. We haven't really defined the concept of counter signatures in, in notation just yet. Um, so I think when we kind of go into kind of like, like calling out how the plugin will handle counter signatures, that's where we would want to kind of call out like how the notation and plugin interface kind of extends into that um, cyclical um, validation of signatures. But I don't think there's anything here that prevents us from going and doing counter signatures when we kind of look at how to validate them. I'll, I'll give a rough example. When we were doing the expiry, optional expiry support, like signature expiry, right? We, we took quite some time to standardize it. Uh, like that's similar, like different vendors have different requirements for what feature sets they want to support for their customers. And that may not align on a kind of a standardization basis across what everybody may or must want to support. And this gives the same mechanism as the signing extensibility where we are not putting things into, into notation, but it allows vendors to innovate in areas that are less standardized that are not a standard yet, et cetera. So do you have a scenario where you think somebody would use this and extend, or are we just creating it on the off chance of opening up a door? So I don't have concrete examples right now, but like just like expiry, these are like additional concepts that can be added by a vendor. And it means there is custom verification logic associated with it. And the verification plugin holds that, give, gives you that logic. So part of the verification logic is offloaded. But so, is this the, do... so the second question, is this a must for RC1? Um, it's a must from, I think, from our perspective in terms of how we um, think about um, um, additional potential feature sets um, and how we look at testing and validating those. So I think this is a, a must from a, our perspective for RC1. Which means testing in the whole, and you've got to write one of these plugins and test the scenario, to make sure it works, correct? How far along are you in that? So the implementation, we are actually, like last two weeks, there's been a lot of progress on implementation. We, we have actually started implementation and submitted some preliminary PRs related to verification. And you're right, in terms of testing, uh, there needs to be like a rudimentary verification plugin implemented. Which, I know, which we, is tested I know you notation. were, I know you were missing your, June 15th date. The question is, is, is this now pushing us even further away? This is one of- I still I, have, I a, I still have a much a, more fundamental question. Though. Like this is just not the, the idea that there is vendor specific things on a signature that might cause a failure. Um, if not, you know, if, if that with any portability to me is that's the one I'm more concerned about because that just, that was so, the counter of what we had with Notary V1. I think I think that's a valid. It's a it's a totally valid concern, but I think a, something to like notice here is not all signatures are meant to be portable. We want to allow signatures to be portable where they are, like for example in a public, ECR public or Microsoft Azure registry or Docker Hub. Those are public images. There are other images which are just used by an organization or on a private basis. So the portability aspect is not as important there. So, we, well, so think, this doesn't hurt portability, but it allows places where you don't have portability as the top priority or, or well, in the would... scenario. I would argue that this is a middle ground on portability, right? Um, there's nothing that's um, um, kind of like, you know, we're imposing here that would be a um, registry specific or a, um, a vendor specific registry implementation or a vendor specific orchestrator implementation, right? Um, I think the plugin essentially enables um, the validation to work in a way where you could 
you know, run this on any orchestrator, run this on any um, sort of registry and still have that level of validation support because the plugin isn't sort of like, you know, um, making a, a, a validation call and then kind of like continuing with the workflow that is still being sort of managed through the notation client. So I would argue that this, this spec actually allows for interoperability on different vendors. Um, it allows the, sig like when you're, when you're making these signature type decisions, um, it allows for additional workflows and it's a point of, of like, you know, um, the end users deciding whether they want to install these plugins and take advantage of those workflows or not. I, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck on the, the uniqueness. Like even we've never scoped anything that internally, internally built images would be signed differently than public images because some of those workflows aren't as well known. And it just, it, it just feels like an extra set of complexity that we haven't surfaced an area that where we think we couldn't agree. So I think if there was like ex even expiring, expire is a standard model. So there's nothing vendor specific, whether something sets it or not, doesn't mean that um, there's a, a code specific to a particular solution that would require that validation. So, well, I, I think the, the way I would think about this is that, you know, when you think about validating a signature, um, we can agree on the standard set of fields, but there may be additional fields that you add in um, sort of things like um, um, like a tagged resource, right? Um, or concepts within for each cloud vendor infrastructure that have implications in terms of how they would want that validation to work. So I think this is, this is kind of getting into one where I don't know that we'd be discussing those specific use cases in notation um, without sort of like understanding like you know, um, how they apply more broadly. Um, but I think this kind of enables a framework where in supporting some of those use cases, we're not necessarily running away from like a core notation framework, right? We're still enabling interoperability um, and a space within which sort of like those plugins can be built out. Um, and then if there are features there that I think can make sense for the broader community use, uh, we can look into what that means from sort of like, you know, bringing them into a notation flow, right? But I think this really is setting up a framework that says that, you know, if there is certain workflows that you want to use that aren't supported by basic notation, um, here's a mechanism and how you can do that without deviating from the notation core specs, right? This allows portability of signature, it allows portability of validation, and it allows portability of signing where you could take advantage of these workflows on any uh, of the vendors. How would you see that? Because like, first of all, once the door is open, how you close it. But if, it, are you suggesting that if I have uh, breaking on Azure, but it might depend on making an ECR service call? I'm um, sorry. Can you others hear that? Could you repeat? Just, Melinda, was everybody? You're better. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, I was saying, this is one of those that once we open the door, I don't know how we manage it because what I'm hearing is, and I'm just picking it, you can pick food company, um, that if AWS puts a certain attribute that requires an AWS validator, that even though I've got portability, I could copy it over, copy it over to an ACR or a Docker Hub or somebody, a JFrog instance, that I might still need an AWS validator to run, which might have to have a dependency on AWS service. So I think that does very much change the portability because portability isn't just about copying some blob across that can't be used unless you have a special key. It's about being able to validate anything that conforms to the notary signature format in any environment. So, so I think still there... like to hear what, what attributes that you're adding that we don't think we can agree on a vendor specific implementation. There's oh, sorry, two a vendor specific... neutral implementation. I think there's two specific uh, kind of sets of question there, right? Um, the first one is how are we making sure that, um, you know, when you're opening the doors, it isn't the wild west, right? Um, that aspect I think is handled by the notation client calling out how it is interfacing with these plugins 
and the interface for sort of like how that validation is coming back to the notation client and enabling sort of like additional workflows, right? So the notation client is still sort of where um, these decisions are being made. Um, and the notation client is what's what's sort of like, you know, figuring out how to ensure that these validations don't necessarily get um, out of scope of what we would want to support from like a signature workflow perspective, right? You need that interface from the notation client to enable that. So I think that's what sort of like, I, I would say it is more risky if we start kind of like going and saying, well, if you want to do sort of validation beyond what's defined in notation, if everyone has to write a custom client from scratch, then that's where I see sort of like more uncontrolled um, sort of like um, behaviors coming in. Um, and that's where I start seeing sort of like risk in how the specification extends over time, because now vendors looking to add some sort of custom logic aren't able to use the notation client or its workflows. They're essentially having to reinvent or are kind of like, you know, make modifications to the signature specification itself outside of notary, right? So that's the risk I see there. Um, and that's why I think I would push more for sort of like having um, notation client be the one that's kind of like looking at this and establishing a framework under which those custom um, logic can be verified. The second part, I think, where you, you're asking sort of like, you know, um, is there a dependency potentially um, on sort of like vendors, um, if you're using a vendor specific workflow, I think that's a vendor and customer and user type decision, right? Um, from the purpose of, from the perspective of like notation maintainers, right? Um, or from my perspective as a maintainer, I think it's up to the end user to say, I want to use vendor B's specific signature because it has this value at for me, recognizing that, you know, if this is a critical workflow, that means I need to ensure that vendor B's plugin um, is something that I am configuring in my orchestrator. Right, um, but the, the 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 way the plugin spec is is defined, it gives you an easy route in configuring and installing and using that plugin. The whole concept of that plugin was that you know we would enable um, these workflows to happen without breaking core notation and getting rid of the interoperability. Um, whether that's a call to sort of like you know ECR or whether that's called to some other you know um, signing infrastructure or new signing service, I don't see why. Um, we should necessarily restrict that, but at the end of the day, it is a you know going to be an end user and vendor decision on um, how they want to um, take on potentially critical um, you know workflows within that signature verification um, and whether they want to use that or not, right? Um, and again, it could also be something that's optional where you don't use the plugin. Um, if the vendor marks it that way, um, I think that's we we want to preserve that optionality for vendors and and users to make those calls. So we're going a bit in circles here. So I want to make a point of time order here. I, I'm not comfortable with, I mean, I just put it out there. I'm not comfortable with this is what our initial goal was for, for notary. So I don't know whether we want to table this or use the rest of the time to finish the conversation because um, there's lots of stuff on the table. But the, the idea that, uh, I mean, we're just talking that there's the vendor new the vendor uh, specifics was supposed to be on the signing ability. So I can have a key vault manager for signing and key management, but it was never around unique validation. I, so I don't just, think I'm I, just I, asking where do we go from here on this in this call? I think we should continue on a little bit more. I, I, I want to say that I, I, I don't agree with that statement that the extensibility was limited to signing. That, that is why I pasted the plugin extensibility. We had both signing and verification extensibility as features from early on. It's just that we had to define all other areas of the signature spec, et cetera, before we could get into this. Um, so I, I, I don't agree that we didn't have an understanding that at least at a high level, there's a feature called verification plugin and verification extensibility is similar to signing extensibility. You can see the early versions of plugin extensibility or the currently committed version that has verification extensibility called out and details around where they can potentially be used. And to, to address or to add on to what Neha said, it builds on the same signature format. It is not a different signature format. It, it's supported both in COSI, 
JWS, etc. It is a standard feature of all signature formats to have a standard set of attributes and make provision for additional set of custom attributes. Similar to what we are doing with JWS, we are defining custom headers, et cetera, right? And creating our own profile. You are extending that same facility to vendors where vendors can extend on notation signature format and add either optional or critical attributes to it. Uh, and to touch upon kind of the wild, wild west, notation still does the integrity and authenticity check. So it's not like you can use a verification plugin to bypass or to kind of deviate from what notation verification does. It'll still so, do the standard set of checks. So Melinda, how does this work when there's cozy as well? Is it going to be multiple plugins or is it one no, plugin? No. So, both, so both the signing and verification are, um, are agnostic of signature format. That, that was one of the goals of the extensibility plugin. Um, you but can- they, they have to know about the signing format and they will only be written for one of them. So how do no, they no. switch? No, no, there, there's, there's nuances there. So in signing, we have two levels of uh, there's a raw signature generator. So you just produce a signature. You don't know about the format. Notation packages that into your format, OZ, JWS, et cetera. And there's an envelope generator, which you have to know. So if you implemented an envelope generator, you every new format, you potentially want to implement it. Uh, for verification, similarly, verification is not uh, signature format dependent. The data that flows over that interface is normalized. So irrespective of JWS or COSI, you don't have to write different plugins. You write the same plugin. We're gonna I test some, this or are we gonna allow this to block moving? I'm just wondering if it's premature, if we truly wanna to move to COSI, that this is gonna be a, a roadblock going forward. This, this is not related to COSI at all. This is like- Yeah, yeah I understand it's not related to COSI, but we have a desire to move to COSI and support a different file format. And this is the interim one. By putting this in now, you're potentially making it harder to move. Um, or are you- I, so I, I, I want to repeat that like JWS is not an intermediate or a alternate format. It's, it's a supported format. And COSI will I, be an I, additional I, supported format. I understand format. that, Melin, but I'm saying, hey, we really want to move to COSI and we allowed it to be pushed at RC1 and now RC1 slipping and if you continue to slip it, I told you we we're going to bring so, this conversation back. Hold on, yeah, sure. I, I think, I think Millen, <laughs> let me jump in here. The, 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 the part to kind of keep in mind what Millen specifically called out is the signature format is at a different layer than where we are kind of looking at how to add these additional fields in, right? Every signature format is, is like when we talk about COSI, when we talk about JWT, the way notation currently is architected, it doesn't matter. We could go in and add PKCS7, we could go in and add additional encoding formats. None of that will impact how the, the plugin extensibility is, is working, right? And when we're looking at sort of like, you know, like what is pushing RC1 dates back, I think there are other functionality and features that, you know, we would want to kind of talk about in terms of like, you know, where we are in terms of what's causing RC1 to push out. Everything that we have put in these specs right now, uh, we are confident we can close on within the RC1 timeline, right? So for us, from our perspective, like kind of getting these changes out is not um, things that I think would cause sort of like RC1 to slip. Uh, when we talk about sort of like testing this, like, you know, we have, um, you know, unit tests and things and coverage here that I think should kind of give like, you know, um, show us like what we're thinking about that. And we can cover those and sort of like, you know, as we're going through code reviews for each one of this, what that testing looks like. But the, the part of, I, I think the way these specs are written right now is that sort of like, you know, that format change of going in and supporting Cozy, we have that extensibility in place. So we don't have to go in and check every part of the, of the, um, um, of the code workflow. The refactoring that's been done here allows us to kind of like, you know, start signing as soon as that Cozy spec is in with all these different use cases with the Cozy format and going and validating them. And Milan, tell me if I'm missing anything there. No, that is correct. Like we consciously did a bunch of refactoring 
and all of the interfaces are defined to be signature format agnostic, specifically for this reason. It may be agnostic, but the plugin, whether it requires their extended headers, needs to know whether it needs to be in this format or another format. And that no, it doesn't. I mean, you, you, you can look at the you can look at the spec, right? It's it's in a normalized format. It doesn't rely on what it is in a in a specific how it is represented. Uh, if you, if you've been seeing what we are doing in notation core go. Notation core go defines a abstract signature format that is not tied to any concrete signature format like JWS and COSI. And we use the abstract signature format in our higher layer in verification code. So our verification code does not rely on JWS or COSI specific. It always goes through this abstract type. And the same thing is used everywhere in our code. So you can support two, three different signature formats as long as they have the same set of features, signed, unsigned attributes, some concept of criticality, et cetera. You can support that. But I think part of, at least my interpretation of part of what, where I was going with the COSI stuff is, is there something about the COSI format that could enable the kind of flexibility you're using that would um, no, keep us from having to have vendor specific capabilities. Because here's the concern I'm worried about. Like all the all the coding and all the scope are all good conversations to have on how do we close down. Like those are valid pieces. I'm still just on the portability aspect. So, and let's just be concrete about this instead of trying to create abstract scenarios. We have shared customers. If a customer is using can, both AWS and Azure, are they going to be coupled to a verification in one cloud or another as opposed to their build system might sign something specific and that might be github aws azure code fresh who knows but in their verification of their production would they be in a case where they have to make a call to outside of their vnetted scenario because they wound up using a vendor specific element as opposed to hey if you sign up for a notary signature format it's not signed up that was duplicate sorry if you're using the notary signature format doesn't matter how you create the signature because we have that flexibility because various key vault providers. Once it's signed, it's transportable and I can run it on-prem in multiple clouds, IOT, VNet, whatever. Having a verification uh, plugin suggests the opposite. I think that's a um, too simplistic um, a view of what um, signature verification might actually require. Um, if you think about even like a revocation check, right? A revocation check is a call on another vendor that, or another sort of like you know infrastructure operator potentially um, that's managing um, that uh, that key information or that revocation information, right? Um, so I think from like a signature verification perspective. Um, if there is a plugin, um, it is up to the vendor to then kind of like, you know, decide whether they want to have like a call to an external service or potentially run some checks locally. Um, I don't think a verification plugin necessarily um, requires a call um, outside, but the call outside aspect of it is already something um, that I think comes up from a revocation perspective itself, right? And so I think the, well, well, we the, the way I... Revocation yet. Right. That this is one of the reasons why we haven't done revocation is because I'm hopeful we can do this better than what CRLs. So, um, so, so ahead, coming Mark. up with a brand new standard that is better than CRL or CSP, though CRL or CSP are broken and expect that every vendor supports that, that is, that is a good long-term goal to have. We can have some initial specs around it but it is it cannot be implemented in a reasonable kind of practical timeline. Uh, so notation has a concept of revocation. We still have to write a spec about what is the standard revocation features that it will provide. But that, that's probably going to be a kind of a lowest common denominator if you just rely on CRL and OCSP. And then you, you're not allowing vendors to innovate beyond that. Uh, so like Nia said, this is an example. Revocation is an example where you could have vendors with different mechanisms to implement that same feature. Agreed, but it's, a, it's also an example of why we didn't do it yet for exactly this concern. So it, that's why it's not, it's a great example of why we didn't do it yet. So 
I don't know if we're gonna come to a consensus on the call and we've used up 40 minutes of our time. <clears throat> um, I would suggest that we continue a separate dialogue with interested parties, continue on Slack, as well as the issue that is related to what was committed for Alpha 3 is what this is related to. So, and obviously on the PR that's up there. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to move on if that's okay. So I want to do um, to, a couple of things before. Um, Saja had a comment related to earlier discussion we have had about this. Uh, Saja, if you want to contribute anything. And like currently verification plugin spec items, implementation items are all linked to RC1. We are currently working on these. The, the team is already working on this. So if we need to have follow-up discussions, yeah, let's let's uh have another additional meeting and then we can talk about it sounds, sounds good i think i'll agree with david here we've kind of like spent 40 minutes on this so um we can follow up on, on another call thanks cool thanks uh so i i know i noticed uh in that there's quite a few prs that are going on right now that need reviewers and so i know I brought up one of these, but I, I don't want to go through every single PR that needs reviewers per se. I think that would be good to um, you know, have another another Slack chat on on what kind of the current ones are. Um, at least on our side, we do have a, a pretty good size one on the notation login that we need reviewers on. And I know uh, Melinda had actually asked for uh, some reviewers last week. I wasn't sure, I know she weighs out, but his team is around. So I wasn't sure who who would be available, but I do know that there's at least a couple people that are able to review. And I know uh, talking with Steve earlier uh, today, we got uh, things resolved in terms of adding uh, Shiwei's team to the, the code reviewers group. So that should, I think, help where we have at least a couple on our side to review yours, but but it would be good, um, Melinda, for you to bubble up who, you know, which PRs are still needing reviews. Um, and then on our side, if you could review our uh, login one, someone on your side, that'd be great. Sure, that makes sense. On, on our side, I think the this is another spec PR related to multiple trust stores and custom verification level. Um, she may give feedback on this. I think the only sticking point is how we implemented the custom verification level. Um, I couldn't get closure with him. If somebody else can review it, that would be great. Yeah, it looks like Steve also had some comments on that as well. So well, that wasn't the only thing. So I would just I continue continue on on that, that thread there. Um, it looks like Steve also reviewed it an hour ago. Um, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, I okay. see, yeah, I'm seeing his comments. I'll, yeah, okay. I'll be able to do it. Okay, so uh, next on the list, um, we have, hopefully this is a quick one, there's a change artifact spec to subject consistent with something else um, that was merged accidentally, I guess. Yeah, Fabian, just, I, I don't know if you accidentally clicked it or, or not, but it, to revert, it's a little more trouble, it, a little more problematic, but I just, is there any concern with that? We were just, we had artifact target, I think, and we've been using subject to be more consistent. And I've seen subject use another signature format envelopes and others. So any concern one way or the other? We, we discussed this earlier where we made a change from subject to target artifact. I think Roy also had feedback on this and we agreed with some of the feedback subject seems related to certificate subject, X509 subject. Whereas in the payload- okay, I, I remember something about this. Yeah. yeah, I remember this conversation. That's why I had it as a PR it as an issue first, because I couldn't remember the discussion. I remember at one point there was content in it that also had subject, which we no longer have. So, I was wondering if that was the issue. Can we revert the PR if it's already committed? Oh, we could easily revert it. I just before, well, it wasn't super easy. I tried and GitHub started complaining because the signing and blah, blah, blah. So it's more a matter of what, what do we want? 
I think we have already had discussion around it and target artifact was much clearer than subject. Um, like, keep, keep in mind that like so some of this naming doesn't, it isn't exposed to end user. Uh, it's internal naming of how we structured the payload and we went with what is logically a correct name. In the scope of everything else we're discussing, it's no big deal. So well, I'll just revert it or I'll, well, we'll figure out how to revert it back. Cool. Okay. So yeah, I'll uh, move on to the next item about um, user stories. I'll share the board up here. Uh, let me share my screen. So, um, hold on. Sorry, I quickly want to ask Rakesh, Ritesh, are there any other implementation PRs that need attention? Uh, yes, from my side, there is one for the basic signature verification. Um, okay. Do you want to like, do you want to just post post those in the in the chat window, and we can circle back yeah. on those. So here, uh, here we have. So I added um, almost all, not not every single user story that was in the Word doc from last time. I wanted to just pause here because these are, I think, some of the I think these are the key ones that we've said are kind of the RC1 type of scope. Um, and so when we click on this, you know, we can also have the, the same kind of linking experience in terms of what it's required to, you know, complete this at a higher level. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, any, uh, we could also sort this via the user story label if, if we wanted. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to, just bring that up, ask if there's any questions or any comments or feedback on, on this. David, this is a very quick question. I don't remember uh, notation cert grid uh, 141. Uh, I understand the, all the others, this one, I don't understand fully well. Uh, can you uh, we can change the title if you want. I just, you know, the dev, dev speak that makes sense. I just put it instead of add list, update, delete. I think the last time, uh, David, when you shared that slide with the feature sets, we said the cert commands will not be in RC1, right? Because that is related to the trust or trust policy. And that requires more time to even formulate what kind of commands we want to have to manipulate the trust policy trust store. Uh, and I think there was a second item, which was the notation cache command. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted clarification from Shiva whether we wanted to retain it in the RC1. Yeah. Uh, same with the list here, so, yeah. Yeah, that's why I didn't add the list with the cache commands because I, I, I wasn't sure on, on the timing of that. But um, I know the cert, there was, I don't know if there was, I don't think there was consensus necessarily on on the cert command. Um, I would I could go back to. I, I don't want to necessarily spend time on it right now, but I could go back to the the roadmap and see if there's what's related to that. But I. Yeah. I think we discussed this already, and we were in agreement. Uh, Steve, for the cert commands, we said. Uh, we, uh, at we least we we'll just have the sign yet. and verify we were, command. We discussed it. I don't think we landed on agreement yet. We were trying to balance the usability. And that was kind of my Uber feedback when I was reading the uh, trust store and trust store policies. There's some great functionality in there. I'm in great discussions, but I was super nervous about the overall usability of it. And then certainly to, to say we're going to an RC1, which is not supposed to have breaking changes from there. So there was a couple different aspects. One is, do we have the right, you know, granularity of functionality and usability should we be shipping an RC1, it's not an RC1, uh, an alpha two or, or something so that we can put what we think is the right level of functionality in, get our hands on it, validate it with some users, give us the option to change it before we start making hard commitments to breaking changes. Um, so there was a, I had a bunch of concern, you know, a bunch of thoughts around that. Um, and the cert command was about trying to make adding you know additional certs and uh, easier to configure. I think the queue gets managed by the plugin 
but the cert doesn't, you know, that's more in the production vendors agnostic scenarios yeah. that I was hoping to make easier. Yeah, so I, I think this kind of, I mean, it touches, it kind of bleeds into what it, what's my, my biggest really concern. Um, and this is that we, you know, this getting to RC1 is something we all want. Um, and it's been kind of keeps moving target um, on and on and on. And I just see, you know, we've migrated everything off of the spreadsheet now. And if we go over to um, the actual list of what's left to do per what's in the roadmap repo and what we have listed in RC1, there's there's a lot of stuff here. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that may, uh, in many cases, not even relate to kind of what is the key, I would say key thing that our users are gonna be doing, right? Um, with, with notation. Um, and that's kind of what we were trying to highlight in the user stories. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think really what we need to do, in my opinion, is, is kind of rescope, um, you know, our milestones and what's, what's the expectation of, of, of what's where, um, because we, we talked last, I think it was the end of January or the end of July, which is now what, two, two-ish weeks away, um, that we would have RC1. And right now this is, you know, we have, we have all these things left in alpha two, alpha three from roadmap, um, and all of these things left in still RC1. And you could see how many don't have it, you have any owners for them. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, David, I don't think so. The items being present there, that means there's work left on them. We may have done a poor job in closing these. Like uh, I was telling you, right? We closed the items in the roadmap after we point in a, in a group meeting like this, up where we say, yep, this work is completed. And we look at that work and then we close these items. So I'm just eyeballing the alpha three items. Majority of this work is on the verge of completing if not completed already. Okay, I, I think the, the, yeah. go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, was, I was just finishing. We have owners assigned to all of these work items and I was tracking that work in the uh, spreadsheet and that work is close to completion based on the dates we have shared. Yeah, I think the um, a general frustration I have here is we're revisiting a lot of the discussions that I feel like we have closed on and we're rehashing a lot of the same conversations, right? Um, we've talked about the cert and key crud in the effect that the way the trust policy and the trust store is kind of like geared towards, um, you know, we're, we're releasing something that doesn't necessarily, uh, that aligns with what we want to deliver in V1. Um, I think kind of like as we think about like what goes into an RC1, we talked about sort of like, you know, how we want to take the approach to APIs. Um, and it seems like we're coming back and revisiting a lot of that again um, uh, in, in sort of like this discussion again today. So I, it's, it's, it's difficult, I think, to kind of like, you know, ensure that as we're kind of allocating engineering resources and completing work, if we're having to revisit scope um, or revisit sort of functionality, um, we're, you know, creating a lot of throwaway work here now. Um, and so that's something I think um, I would push to kind of like go through what we've already discussed in the past. And if we are going to, if there's a reason to kind of make changes on what we've already agreed upon for RC1 or what we've already agreed upon is in scope, like we should have a good reason for revisiting those discussions. That's all fair. I think that's part of what David's trying to land in these user stories as to what are the user stories we're trying to enable for RC1 and, and an alpha two or three is a step along those ways. It's not that we're trying to push out, but if we're gonna hold RC1 to a breaking, no breaking changes, then I, I'm seeing way too much functionality being added to feel comfortable we're gonna get it right the first time. It, yeah, it feels, it feels like we're really wide in our scope and like, like whether it's an RC1 or not, it just, it, like, you know, for instance, I, I just see a lot of a lot of challenges. Like we talked about, oh, we're not going to have local local you know signing and local other things based on what we talked about from the user stories for RC one. Well, and I, I see that. Like, I, I, yeah. I, I so think that, kind of like, you know, I'll use that as an example of how I would want these discussions to go, right? Like when we looked at RC1 features, we agreed that yes, we would want to do local signing. 
when we went to kind of go implement local signing, I think we discovered an issue that kind of has us taking an additional scope to go say, we now need to ensure how we're handling um, ciphertext or, or sort of keys on local hosts securely. And it didn't make sense to punt all of the remaining functionality, which is why we agreed that this is a feature set that if this is what's holding up RC1, makes sense to push out to RC2 so we can test out all of the remaining functionality. Um, where I would disagree is saying that the functionality that we have discussed to date, the specs that we're talking about now is all functionality that we have closed on in the past. It's really kind of going in and putting in details around the functionality and specs that we've agreed at at a high level, right? So if there is some pushback around some of this high level specs, I'm questioning sort of like, you know, um, did we not review them in enough detail? Like, you know, are we not recalling things and do we need to go back and revisit those before we come into some of those discussions? Uh, but that's really the part that I'm, I'm, I'm finding a little difficult to make meaningful progress because for every feature set, if we have to go back and kind of start back from use cases, we're not gonna be able to close on those discussion in hour long meetings. I, yeah. if, Niaz, are you referring specifically to the uh, cert create or as a detail of measuring usability or are you more worried about this verification piece? Um, I would say it's it's coming in in all of the three discussions we've had today, right? Um, we've covered how we look at sort of like, you know, signature format extensibility. Um, we've covered how we look at sort of like the verification plugin at a high level before. Um, we've made these conversations around um, sort of like, you know, how we want to look at uh, the local cert usage, right? Um, these are all three conversations we've spent ample time on um, in past meetings. And it sounds like, you know, although we had kind of pulled in PRs and documented that, um, we don't really have consensus, right? Um, it seems like we're revisiting a lot of decisions we've already hashed out. Well, let's just take a couple of those off because I think one of them, at least one of them is easier to get more complex. I think the local signing, we've agreed that we want to be able to support. We had some complex, two pieces of our local signing is the private key local, so we don't need key vault providers. That I think we've agreed that we will support because we wanna have good usability to get people started. There was complexity around the images are local and I wanna do everything offline locally before I push. That's the piece that I think we've agreed to punt to a later date. Are we in sync on that? We are in, yeah, we are in sync about the local signing as in sign an artifact locally without having access to registry. Right. And then the key, we still have a local key that's available, a private, sorry, yes, a private local key. So I think that one, I don't think we actually disagree on and the piece and even the fact that we do want to do local offline signing is purely a, a time resource complexity issue which is not reflected here on our planning board well i thought we tried actually i think we got ourselves confused between a local private key versus local offline signing but i, I thought we did it we, we might want to update the board to reflect that so, so of the so, three so, things if you take that one off yeah so so samir you, i want to make sure he, he he had your hand raised for a while so please jump yeah, in sorry i can't see that so I think, sorry, I was had my hand raised for a prior discussion uh, where I jumped in already and didn't take it down. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, I mean, the thing that I would, I, I think to give, to give a bit more confident, confidence on both sides on timelines, because we both, we all want timelines. Um, I, you know, like we've, you know, we have a lot of, um, on our side, owners for, you know, things being done. And, and I think at a roadmap level, if you're saying a lot of these things are done, I would love to close them all out um, as done so that we can actually get an accurate assessment of what really is left to do. And then for all the things that are actual work that needs to be done, you know, like we need to have owners and we need to have like, you know, the things that we had in the spreadsheet so that we can have an accurate assessment of, of when we're going to ship what um, and you know, so we can, we can plan and have reasonable expectations for our users. Because when I when I look at this right now, I I don't see how we're going to get all this work done in two weeks. There's no way. 
So is it the fact that we just have them closer? And I understand what Nias is saying is you continue to seem to circle back to existing topics. Yeah, well, right. well yeah. So I, I get that point in general. I mean, I, I don't, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think at this, this is a different problem though. I mean, like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. this, this, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, like I, I think there, there, there's probably things that we're working on that we, we don't like, we don't even necessarily need to to call RC1 right now, or maybe we need to have a different milestone. I don't know, but um, I, I can't in, in strong confidence say we're shipping an RC1 in two weeks um, based on I, everything I'm seeing. I, I wouldn't I'm want to, to put a date. Sorry, go ahead, Roy. I, I'm just saying if, if we've already gone through this, we probably need to put a pin in, in some of these and say, we're not coming back to these the foreseeable future just to get us to the ship cycle. And I agree, David, that you need to try and get the paperwork done and agreement here. Niaz, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I think there's, um, um, there's, it's great that you've kind of put all of these things together um, in the list of items. Um, it gives us something to kind of go back and check on, on, on what we've kind of like, you know, um, contributed so far. Um, what I would say is what's probably missing here is accurate tracking information in terms of where these things actually are. Um, I would say let's share this, let's go back and, and kind of start putting in um, from the engineering side and, and from everyone that's been working, what things have been put up, where we are in those, um, and we can potentially tie in um, information here. Um, and Samir and I can take a look and, and kind of see sort of like, you know, where we have um, kind of talked about certain feature sets in RC1. Um, and I would, um, Steve, I think you and, um, you know, on the, on the other side, you can take a similar kind of approach to it. Um, but I think we want to get this tracker up to date before we start having discussions around, you know, um, how far behind are we from getting an RC1 out and what we actually need to do from an RC1 descoping. Um, so let's take a, um, I would say an action item to come back and revisit this in our next meeting. Okay. Can we do it? Yeah, I know we're I know we're out of time, but that'd be that'd be great. Um, Can we do then, any of that know, off? And then that's right. I was just gonna say also also I mean just just the the spirit behind it is is that so we also have some form of like more regular um, release cadence um, and and agreement and priorities because even if let's say you know okay RC one's not gonna be done for a while like you know we are at this point I have having quite a bit of PRs and quite a lot of things merged in. And I think it'd, it'd be important for us to show progress, um, you know, once every so often, let's say every month or every two months um, of doing a release uh, versus waiting six months or more or whatever, um, like we've seen from history uh, to, to show progress and, and move the project forward in a, in a good manner. Yeah, I think our approach to kind of scoping RC1 was ensuring that we were providing a set of functionality that would be useful um, and that, you know, we looked at sort of like what are things that could potentially done in an RC2 release that wouldn't necessarily impact some of that functionality. Um, and I think this is one where we, we kind of like took a very hard look in terms of like, you know, what functionality could we do without um, and where were places where there was um, additional scope, right? Um, I think the, the the signing with local keys is a prime example of that. Like that is something that we all thought was highly desirable, but given the effort that it takes, like it was a hard decision to punt it to RC2. Um, it's good to have this tracker because I think it forces that conversation. Um, so let's just, yeah, I agree. Go take a look at sort of like, you know, where we are and then we can come back and have that similar descoping or rescoping discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of things in here that I don't think we've we even said we want to have in RC1 as well. I mean, so I think there, there needs to be a pass through this. I mean, look, look, you know, some of these things like key management, um, a lot of these things, right, are I, I'm feeling like probably not in scope for RC1. So I don't know if we want to do this on the next call or a, a separate call, but I think there's a lot of backlog, you know, kind of grooming and refining that we need to do to, to be in sync. Yeah, I think uh, some of these items we have talked about in the past are stale. They have been uh, issues that we were thinking about nine months ago, but we haven't gone them and curated them. You'll find a lot of those items there, which were abandoned or left a uh, poor job on my part or others, all of us not close them, but yes, we find them. 
we'll find a lot of these are no ops. So does somebody want to take a pass at trying to mark this up? Yeah, I think uh, like Nia said, if we all just take a step back and look at the items we are more familiar with, mark them up if we are working on them first, uh, because that's the first thing we should do to mark items we're actively working on. Anything left will be a candidate for deprecation after that. Yep, and then and then in my mind as well, it's like if, if any of these things in alpha two and alpha three are are still valid and not complete, um, and they don't have a, an, a, at least one issue associated with the work to be done, then that that needs to be a, an important step. Yeah, I, I think what we decided to do was the let all the implementers, Steve, what you and I talked about at one time, right? Let's let the work happen organically and we'll track the work. So I think what has happened is the work tracking has slightly fallen off the radar, but with this, uh, with this tracker now, we can go back and update the work which is being done. So the item will be for all the implementers, including me and David, to go back and make sure items you're working on are assigned with a name to it. Yeah, and then I and then I think also, I mean, part just uh, you know, as we go through this, I mean, part of the reason uh, why we did the you know added the user stories is so that we can hopefully try and keep that focus because um, you know a user <laughs> is is it uh, most users aren't going to care about the maybe the nitty gritty details of a spec that isn't implemented yet, right? They're they're going to probably care more about what can I do right now um and so maybe you know maybe just trying to trying to come back to that as we as we go through prioritizing um you know what is it this the the key functionality we want to land in rc1 um for our users is um as we as we kind of prioritize things i agree i and, think what you're calling is user stories we were calling some of them as roadmap items and i noticed you closed some of them uh, because we have a user story for them in some uh somewhere else yeah i think all user stories you had we were tracking them as roadmap items with a different name so we need to align that and i can show that to you i can send you yeah there's only a couple that i that i closed and you and i had a conversation on that before this call i think it, i'd love to continue to have that dialogue with you um okay you know on on what we could do do there to to help make things more clear because okay. not not all the roadmap items are necessarily user stories which is fine but okay yep Uh, Melind. Yeah, I just want to say unrelated to this before we close. Um, want to resolve the verification plugin discussion as soon as possible. Um, that that will already be blocking my team. Uh, if we can schedule something as soon as tomorrow, I would like at least Steve, Sajay, you to be there, Roy. Um, me and Nias can attend and we can put the call details on the note VV to uh, read me. Yeah, I'll go through the document tomorrow and, and hopefully give you feedback on the side. Okay. Because yeah, you kind of need to do this fast and block one way or another. I don't want people sitting there spinning their wheels because we haven't signed off or we haven't agreed on something. Yep, yeah, well, agreed. Thanks, sir. Can we do the? I'm just double checking my calendar at least. If we can do the four to five hour tomorrow, but let me see if. Can we do the four to five hour tomorrow? Checking. Yeah, I can do four to five. Um, I can do. Niaz, Sajer. It works yeah. for me as well. So let's do that and see if we can unblock and, and decide which way we're going to go. Um, yeah, and appreciate a review on Ben Ben's PR again. Um, that'd be great. That's um, it's up there. So linked as well. Okay. Well, I'm going to go get some supper. Thank you. All righty. Um, Thanks, everybody. Have, have a good one. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, yeah, what was it? One? Yeah, will Sajay be also be able to attend because he's yeah, I'll be able to there attend. in the earlier discussion. Awesome. Right. Thanks.
So we're good? Yeah, thanks, folks. All right. right. Thanks, folks. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye. For some reason, I can't mute the call.